Atheists find this story among their favorite stories in the Bible. Now, it's interesting, I did some research, it's actually one of the top stories that are used by atheists, skeptics, and infidels to discredit the scriptures. And the point is, how could this take place? They believe that Jephthah actually killed his daughter in order to fulfill his vow. Commitment issues. Commitment issues is something that I have uh, felt impressed to talk about. It's probably a strange title. You probably would not guess what the topic is by a title of that sort. But I want to talk about commitment a little bit today because commitment is a bit of a problem in the world today. Uh, if, if you were to define commitment, what's another word you would use for commitment? Marriage. Dedication. Marriage, dedication. Commitment is like a promise, or a vow, or a pledge, or a word of honor that you will do something. Uh, have you ever made a vow or a promise that you later regretted? I want you to think about some of these things. What about uh, the situation where you had to alter your promise or your vow because you realized that uh, it would not be very wise to keep it? And have you maybe uh, learned that it's better not to promise as often as you do, perhaps. Commitment and promises and saying and doing, something I want to talk about today. Uh, in the world, we have a very big problem with regards to commitment. It's called commitment phobia, actually. It's the most common phobia that people have. And that is really the fear of commitment. It particularly relates to relationships, uh, between the different uh, sexes, of course. It affects not only relationships, though, with people, but relationships with everything, with work, with study, but it's a relationship problem. And the sad fact of the matter is, this is not only a problem in the world, this is also a problem in the church. There are many in the church who also have commitment phobia, fear of commitment with regards to a very important relationship. And this is what I want to examine today in a, in a practical manner, uh, hopefully. And of course, uh, today we're going to look at a very interesting vow and a very interesting lesson that we want to draw from this vow. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you may use them. I have the text on the screen. I'll put some pictures up so that the younger ones in the audience can uh, also have their attention with us as well. So there will be things on the screen. You can look, open your Bible. And I want us to turn in our Bibles to the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, we have a very interesting and intriguing story. Judges chapter 11. We have one of those puzzling stories that you rarely ever hear any sermons about. I personally have never heard any sermons about this. And I'm not surprised really why people don't tackle this story. It's one of those stories that you only read, but you leave alone from up the front, or so it seems. There are some stories in the scriptures that are a bit like that. But today I want us to tackle the story, and I want us to see what lessons we can practically draw about commitment, and how that can really uh, help us. Judges chapter 11, and we'll actually begin right in the heart of the matter, because some of us might not be familiar with the story, and then we'll go in detail a little bit. Judges chapter 11, we'll read verses... 30 and 31. And in Judges 11, we have this very puzzling incident. And we read it together. Verse 30 it says, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. And of course, the rest of the story tells us that when he returned, his daughter met him. And the Bible says he did to her according to his vow. As we want to examine the story a little bit, because some of us might not be familiar with the story. Some might not be familiar with the vow. I just want us all to understand what we're going to get to and what this vow means and why this story is actually recorded in the scriptures. And are there any lessons for us to draw out from this story. You know, in doing research about this story, I found it really interesting in reading different people's comments about this story. It is very, very varied 
and very, very different. There are all kinds of comments about this story as to what Jephthah really did with his daughter. It's one of those questions that over the millenniums have been a very big debate and a very big puzzle. And there are very many opinions. Some of you might be sitting there, you have certain ideas and understanding as to what that story really means or what really took place. So we want to examine that today and see what we can learn. It's a puzzling story, but it actually does not need to be a puzzling story. So let's break it down a little bit. We'll first start at the very top and see about this man. Who was this man, Yefta? Who was he? The Bible tells us in verse 1, Judges 11 and verse 1. It tells us, Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. So it simply tells us his lineage. He was a man who lived in the tribe of Manasseh. And of course, geographically, the tribe of Manasseh was on the east side of the Jordan. That means he lived in a tribe that was a border tribe. It was not surrounded by other tribes of Israel. The next uh, neighbor was actually an enemy. It was a border tribe. It was on the very edge. And so that resulted in be, uh, having many uh, conflicts, many interactions with the enemy. So... Uh, this was his lineage, and of course this man later became, in this story, he became a judge in Israel. And the Bible tells us, of course, uh, a little later, that his uh, lineage caused him a, a bit of a problem. It tells us here that he was the son of an harlot. Not only was he a mighty man, a brave man, but he was the son of a harlot, and as a result he got some bad treatment. Verse 2 and 3. And Gilead's wife bare him sons. And his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tul. And there were gathered vain men unto Jephthah and went out with him. So he is disinherited because he is not of good stock. Persecuted, cast out, no inheritance. And his... Uh, Situation really reminds us of David. The men who, and the meaning of vain men here, uh, it kind of gives the wrong impression. These are men who did not have an occupation or a job. They banded together with Jephthah, and he was this mighty man of valor. Very much like David, when he was oppressed and persecuted by Saul, and he had to flee, and there were many men in Israel that banded together with David, that later became his army and the generals and the leaders of his army. So we have a similar situation here many years before. Jephthah, uh, sorry, many years before David's time, of course. Now, the meaning of his name is also interesting, as we shall see. Uh, does anyone know what the name Jephthah means, or Jephthah in Hebrew? Open, or the opener, or he will open. That's what his name uh, means. Anyway, let's uh, see what else takes place. We'll press on. Let's read down to verses 5 and Six, something now interesting happens to this mighty man of valor. It says, And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob, and they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of, of Ammon. So obviously this man had a good reputation for being a man of valor. A man of might, a man of bravery, so much so that the elders of the very place that had cast him out now sought him out to help them to overcome the enemy, the children of Ammon. So obviously, Jephthah and his men were expert in making raids, and they had many forays with the enemy. And he had, had gained a reputation for being successful in doing so, that now the elders of Gilead said, you know what, we need your help, we are in trouble, we need your help. And of course, his response was quite interesting. We read it in the next verses, verses 7 down to 9. Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of... Gilead. That was their request. They not only wanted him to come and fight for them, but they wanted him to be the head. 
Now it's interesting here what Jephthah answers and says, verses 9 down to 11. It tells us here, Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? So his question here is really one of almost disbelief. He says, you're the people who kicked me out. You know, I had good reason to distrust them, isn't that right? And he says, if, if I come and fight, will you really make me your head? And of course, their answer, they continue and said, And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. So we have this discourse that takes place. But the interesting thing here I want us to note is we want to learn a little bit more about the man Jephthah as we're progressing in the story. Here we find that Jephthah was a man who feared God. Isn't that right? He calls the Lord as a witness. And he also is a man that knew if he had any hope or any chance of winning the battle against the Ammonites, the Lord was the one who would deliver them into his hand. Because he told them, if the Lord give me the battle, will you really make me the head? And then it tells us that they went and they uttered all this agreement in Mizpah before the Lord. So Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. He had a good reputation of being brave. He also was a man who knew God. He was also a man that trusted in God to give him the victory. These are good characteristics for this man. Now he takes command of Gilead with the blessing of God. And he begins to act as a responsible leader of Gilead. He now begins to act in his capacity as the leader of this people tells us we continue verses 12 down to 14 notice how the story now becomes quite interesting Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon saying what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land and the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon even unto Jab Jabok and unto Jordan now therefore restore those lands again peaceably and Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon. So we have a discourse here. The characteristic I want us to notice about Jephthah is he didn't say, Okay, men, gather your swords and let's go attack the enemy. Isn't that right? He was not a man who was rash or thirsty for a fight. He actually was diplomatic. And he asked the, the king of the children of Ammon, says, what, what have I done that you're coming to fight against me? What's the problem here? He tried to negotiate peaceably with the children of Ammon. Of course, the children of Ammon requested that he give up the land. And let's notice now Jephthah's response. And in Jephthah's response, it's a bit lengthy, but we'll read it together. I want you to note that Jephthah demonstrates a very thorough knowledge of the leadings of God in Israel's past. And I want you to pay careful attention to that. And he presents a case that really hardly needs any comment. I find it very interesting, this dialogue. Let's read it together anyway. Continuing down, verses 15 down to 28. Jephthah now replies, he sends a message back. And he said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt, and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness and come past, that is, they bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Hezbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. 
Verse 21, And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabuk, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And shouldest thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and Arair and her towns, and in all the cities that be, that be along by the coast of Arnon, three hundred years why therefore did he not recover them within that time? Wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah which he sent him. Now this is a very interesting narrative because the key point that we see here is Jephthah presents a very just cause for this war. He says, this war should not happen. And he says something very interesting at the end. He says, the Lord, the judge, be judged this day. This was a man that put his trust in God. This was a man that was familiar with God's leading. He was familiar that the victories that Israel had was because of God. God fought for Israel and God delivered Israel. That's a point here. He was familiar with the history. And his dependence on God is very, very obvious. And so obviously, the Ammonites did not hearken. And so we read in verse 29, what takes place. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So this man was guided by the Spirit of God, or at least influenced by the Spirit of God. He is very zealous for God, and he now prepares for battle to fight for the deliverance and victory of his people. And it's in this context that we then read verses 30 and 31. And this is the troubling part of the story. You know, so far the story would be a classic story like many others. But now comes the troubling part, and this is his vow. As Jephthah is preparing to go to battle, he does something a lot of people think is strange. Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up, offer it up for a burnt offering. Now, like I said before, it's an interesting exercise going and reading what other people have to say about that. Many scholars and many Bible commentators and critics have actually uh, used this passage to paint God in a very false light. They believe that Jephthah actually killed his daughter in order to fulfill his vow. Now, I don't see that, and we will examine the story to see what it actually happened. But the implication, obviously, is that God accepted human sacrifices, although he condemned them. Because, after all, Jephthah said, if you give me the victory, I will carry out this act. And so they say, well, if the act was that he would offer her up, meaning kill her, therefore God is implicated here. Do you see the connection? And so it paints God in a very false light. Atheists find this story among their favorite stories in the Bible. Now, it's interesting, I did some research. It's actually one of the top stories that are used by atheists, skeptics, and infidels to discredit the scriptures. And the point is, how could this take place? And actually, that's a very false misrepresentation of God. Commentators say, you know, there is no sadder story in the Bible. They call this vow the rash vow of Jephthah. Because they really think that she was actually slaughtered by her father 
in order to fulfill his vow. Is that really what happened? Is that what this man of God really intended when he made this vow? And what really is the purpose of God recording this story for us in the scriptures? This is what we want to understand. So we want to analyze it a little bit. First of all, we want to ask the question. This man who knew God, this man who was wise, who negotiated with the enemy, who was not rash to jump into battle. Are these the characteristics of a man who would make a rash vow like that? The answer, of course, is no. He was not in the heat of battle. He was not losing and so threw up a prayer to heaven and as a final measure to convince God to give him the victory. Not at all. He was not under pressure. He was not doing anything that would cause him to think in a strange way. He was actually very calm about making this vow. He made a commitment. You see, this man made this vow because he so much wanted God's people to have the victory. In essence, he was saying, I wa Lord, we want this victory so much that I am willing to give and offer in thanksgiving and gratitude whatever comes out of the doors of my house to you. That's how much he wants this victory. This is the key here. You see, he realized, he knew and understood that in order for him to have any hope of a victory, God had to play a part in it. And if God had to play a part in it, Jephthah also made a commitment. He said, Lord, if you give me that victory, I want to express my appreciation, my thanksgiving, because I would want that victory so much. And he couldn't think of anything or anyone that he could pinpoint. And so he left it to God and he left it to circumstances. And he said, Lord, whoever comes out of the door of my house is yours. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. That's the troubling part. We want to look at that a little bit. You see, the real motivation that Jephthah had was love for his people. And for the persever perseverance, he wanted to preserve the honor of God, the God of Israel. This is his motivation here. And this is the key that we find. Far from it being a rash and a thoughtless vow, it is actually a well thought out vow. He wanted to impose upon himself something that would cost Something that would not be easy to express his appreciation. Now, some of us reading that today, I understand, especially in the Western type of a culture, would think that it is very strange to do that. It's a very strange thing. Most of us reading that story would say, I, I would never say that or do that. But it's not too strange because you remember another story in the Bible, a woman by the name of Hannah who wanted a child from God so much that she also made a very similar vow. And it was very interesting. It's amazing you think about the vow of Hannah. She wanted a child so bad that she said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'm going to give him back to you. Isn't that interesting? And this is the similar thought here we find. Jephthah saying, Lord, I want this victory for God's people so bad that I'm willing to give something as a token of gratitude for the fact that you will give me this victory. You see, Jephthah said, uh, whatsoever cometh out of the doors of my house. Uh, Jephthah was not expecting an animal to come out of his house. That's very important to understand. He was not expecting a lamb or a cow to come out of the doors of his house. He was expecting a human being, a person. Uh, that's very, very clear from the language there. Someone coming out of his house will be someone close to him, someone that is near and someone that is dear, whether it be a wife or a relative or a son or a daughter or whoever would be an occupant of his house. And this is really what he was meaning. He understood what he was saying. And as we said, it would be something that was uh, difficult. It wasn't something that was easy. He wanted to give in gratitude something more than just a sacrificial an animal. This is the point here. Because it was customary that in victory when they returned, they would offer not one sacrifice, would be a lamb or sheep or whatever it is, but many sacrifices. Jephthah did not have that in mind. He was thinking of something else. What about the part where it says a burnt offering? This is the part that a lot of people struggle with, but it's very interesting because you look up the meaning, you find some very interesting facts. The word there in Hebrew is Ola, and it actually means a whole burnt offering. Or to give up, or to lift up, or like a stairway, it has the connotation of lifting up. 
And the key here is not the burning, but it's the whole burnt offering. It's called a whole burnt offering, but it doesn't necessarily mean burning. And this is what the commentaries tell us about it. Uh, the word there, Allah, as we said the Hebrew, does not involve the idea of burning, like our word, burnt offering, but simply that of going up upon the altar, or of complete surrender to the Lord. Allah is a whole offering, as distinguished from other sacrifices of which only a part was given up to the Lord. So in other words, here Jephthah was saying, whoever comes out of the door of my house will be wholly the Lord's, I will give him to the Lord, and he will be offered as a whole offering is offered. In other words, he's saying, there will be the Lord's completely and fully, just like a whole offering is given to the Lord. That's really what he was saying. And this is what he was meaning. And of course, we know the rest of the story. God granted him the victory, knowing full well what he had vowed. We read in verse 32 and 33, Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from our rear, even until thou cometh to Minith, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. So the victory is clearly from the Lord. And this is where misunderstanding the story actually paints God in a false light. God knew the vow that Jephthah made. And it's interesting, a lot of people really blame God. Like I said, you know, in reading some of the comments that people make, I find it strange how people think, or perhaps not think as much. But these are perhaps people who are skeptic, they are uh, infidels, they are not interested in believing the Bible, they want to discredit the Bible. And they say things like, you know, God knew his vow, he could have made him lose, in order to avoid the slaughter of his daughter. That's the key in their head of the story, this, this gruesome, barbaric story. How this man would kill his daughter. And it paints God in a false light. When that is really not the case at all. So Jephthah receives the victory from the Lord. He returns home victorious with the army. But the news travels of course ahead. And this is the part where it gets uh, very close to home. Verse 34. As Jephthah, and Jephthah came to Misphah to his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. The Bible is emphasizing something here for a reason. His daughter comes out. And of course the first thing that comes into his mind is what? His vow that he made. He didn't know who was going to come to meet him. But of all people that occupied the house, it's his daughter. And then the Bible tells us here, this daughter was his only child. He had no one else. It, it brings out the difficulty of now this vow, how close to home it really is. And his reaction is very clear as to how that affected. In verse 35, it came to pass when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. And thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Imagine the scene. Here is Jephthah, victorious with all the army, celebrating very likely. And he comes home, and now this victory all of a sudden turns bitter. He's grieving. He rends his clothes, and he says, My daughter, you have brought me very low. Why is he grieving? Is he grieving because he has to kill his daughter now because that's what he vowed? Not at all. You see, Jephthah knew the law. He knew that human sacrifices were an abomination in the sight of God. We saw that he was very familiar with the history of Israel that he recounted to the king of Ammon. And he would be familiar that in the law, God says it's an abomination, it's a de detestable abomination to offer up human sacrifices. Jephthah was not grieving because he's going to kill his daughter, not at all. He was familiar with what the law said. He was really grieving for something else. You know, I can imagine, what I cannot imagine actually what, what it would have been like for Jephthah and his daughter. 
realizing now the enormity of the sacrifice that he would have to make. And I use the word sacrifice here, uh, not meaning slaughter. He was grieving because she was his only child. What does that mean to an Israelite? That his name will be wiped out if that child has no children after. You see, she was his only chance of perpetuating his seed. And now he realizes that in order to keep his vow, it would mean that he would not have any seed from his daughter. Especially was this hard for Jephthah because he was disinherited by his brothers or half-brothers. And now he has just been reinstated. He's just gained a victory. And now he has an inheritance that he can leave to his seed, but he will not have any seed through his daughter. And he grieves. He's going to be wiped out of memory. And that's a grieving thing, especially for Israelites. Uh, you know that the Bible t uh, presents us a lot the importance of ancestry and chronology. The Gospel of Matthew tells us all about the ancestry of Jesus Christ. That was important for the Hebrews, who you were and who you came from and the continuation of the line. So Jephthah grieves because his race and his name must die because he will not be able to have any grandchildren. Jephthah was willing to give up that which was near and dear to him for the sake of the victory of God's people. This was something close to home. This was a real test now for his commitment. And I'm sure the thought would have run through his mind. What will he do? Will he keep his vow? Or will he say, well, you know what? Maybe the Lord will understand in this situation. And he tells us very clearly. He said, I open my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. He understood. Here was a man who did not have any commitment phobia. He did not have any fear of commitment. He made a commitment. It was a serious commitment. It cost him a lot and he did not back out. That's very important. This is a very uh, powerful principle that comes out in this story. But let's see what else happens. We continue on verse 36. And 37, and she said, now this is her reaction, his daughter's reaction. She said unto him, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And verse 38, it tells us what else happened. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months. And she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. Now I find the reaction of the daughter very, very interesting. You know, she didn't say, Dad, that was a very silly thing to do. She said, Father, do to me as you have vowed, because I know that the Lord gave you this victory. Just let me go and bewail my virginity. See, she recognized that the victory was from God. So this was not a pagan man who was committing pagan actions here. This was a man that had brought up his daughter to know and fear God. She recognized the victory was from God. He had taught his child well. And she demonstrated a principle here that I want to, I don't want us to miss. A principle of honor that costs so much that most of us would shrink from even considering the possibility of putting someone in that option. It cost so much. It was a very serious conviction, a very serious commitment. Otherwise, they would not have carried through with it, with this vow. And she, it says here that it affected her, of course. She had to go and bewail her virginity. What does it mean when it says bewail her virginity? Why is she bewailing? Why is she grieving? Bewail my virginity because that was her lot. That was going to be her situation. And that caused her grief. Why would it cause her grief? She's lamenting because she will never 
marry. She will never be a wife. She will never be a mother. She will never be a grandmother. Ever. And he says, Father, do that to me, but just give me time so that I can go and lament my virginity with her fellows, with her friends. You see, she knew what her father's vow meant. She knew that she wasn't going to be killed. She understood that. But she understood that it would be a very great sacrifice. Above all else, she is very well grieving the fact that she would never ever be the possible mother of the Messiah. And that was a heavy blow for a woman in Israel. That was the hope of every girl in Israel. That they would perpetrate the seed of Israel. That they would expand Israel. And maybe, just maybe, the Messiah would be born to her. And here is this daughter saying, Father, this is the things that she gave up. I want you to do that for me, but just let me go and bewail my virginity. This daughter gave up a lot in order to keep the vow of her father. So children, pay careful attention here because this is really important. She encouraged her father to be faithful to the commitment that he made to God, even though it cost her so much. That's rare today. Let's keep reading and see what else takes place. So this young girl had to give up a lot. We will never probably uh, know her name until we get to the kingdom. She's only known as Jephthah's daughter. But the sacrifice that she made is really uh, mind-boggling. You know, as I was thinking about that, I just thought that's, that's quite amazing. Uh, children today would really say, you know, to their parents, this is not a good idea. That's your vow, that's your problem, not my problem. She gave up her future entirely in order to ensure the faithfulness of her father to his commitment to God. Isn't that something? That is sacrifice. And so it tells us here in verse 39, And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. And she knew no man. Here's the explanation of how he carried out his vow. It had nothing to do with killing her. His vow was to set her apart and give her completely to the Lord, meaning that she would never marry. She would never become a wife or a mother. She would be wholly the Lord's. And that's the explanation, that she would remain a virgin for the rest of her life. She was set apart for the purpose of serving the Lord. Now that involved... A sacrifice that involved a giving up of something that is dear and that is precious. And then it tells us in the next verse, there was a custom in Israel. The, the custom in Israel belongs to the next verse. That's it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in a year. Now the word translated lament here should not be translated lament at all. Maybe that was a bit of a bias on the part of the translators reading a little bit into the story. The word lament here actually means to praise and to honor. And if you have your Bible open there, uh, the King James margin actually tells us also what this word means. Does anyone have a margin or reading there for verse 40? For lament? Memorize. Commemorate? Sing, the praise of. Sing praise of. Anyone else? To talk with. Did you pick that up? To talk with. So it says the daughter of Israel went yearly to talk with the daughter of Jephthah. That obviously means that she was alive. Here's another translation that spells that out plainly. In Young's literal translation, it says from time to time, the daughters of Israel go to talk to the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. So they're not communing with the dead here. They're talking with the daughter of Jesus. She, she's alive and well. She's just not married. And Israel, this, this talk with or to commemorate or to celebrate, Israel here is recognizing the sacrifice that this man and his daughter did in order to gain the victory for them. And they commemorate that act. They praise that act. Nothing at all about her being dead. So yearly, this was a custom in Israel to go and talk with 
daughter, to have to encourage her, to comfort her, and to applaud the great price paid in order to stay faithful to the vow that her father had made. And this man continued as a judge for six years. Now I want to quickly uh, see, just to close here, almost there, how God viewed this situation. How did God view the vow of Jephthah? And what was God's reaction to this man? And how does that help us today? What are the practical applications of that story for us today? Why is it according to the scriptures? That's the question I ask myself. Because I know when, when I was growing up, I remember I, I heard this story. I, I didn't get to it when I was very young, a bit older. And I remember it intrigued me. It fascinated. It's just stuck in my mind, the story of Jephthah and his vow. And I remember having many discussions with my father as to whether, did he kill her or not? What happened? What was the fate of the daughter? Uh, and, and when I actually went through and studied it properly, it wasn't that hard to figure out. But then the next question was, well, what does that mean for us today? What's the practical application for us today? How was the reaction of God? First of all, the thing that uh, Jephthah was grieving about was that his name would be wiped out. But God did something for Jephthah. You know, God, the Bible tells us, God answers and gives us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God recognized that Jephthah had made a very, very great sacrifice. And God has immortalized his name. That when the scriptures were being recorded, God inspired the man. He said, remember to take special note and make mention of the sacrifice of this man. The vow that Jephthah made. This is the key in this story. The, 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 his victory was great, but in close association is this vow or this sacrifice that this man was willing to give to ensure the deliverance and victory of God's people. It has a very practical lesson for us. God regards a commitment that costs very much, very highly. Very, very highly. Jephthah is actually later uh, mentioned in uh, the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, Samuel recounting here. It says, And the Lord sent Jerubal and Bidan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and he dwelt safe. Here was a man that was sent by God. And the beautiful thing I find about this story is this man that had thought that his name will now be forever lost because he will not have any seed from his daughter. God says, I will preserve your name forever. And God actually records his name in a very important part of the Bible that we all like. In the chapter of faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 says, What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Isn't that amazing? God honored the commitment of this man. He says, your name is not going to be forgotten. You know, wouldn't you like your name to be written in that chapter? Here is a man that had made a commitment. It cost so much, but he went through with it. And God recognized that commitment, that sacrifice. God said, put his name as an example of faith for you and me to follow. To inspire us. He's part of the great cloud of witnesses that Paul talks about in Hebrews chapter 12. And of course, uh, you know, when we talk about faith, someone would say, well, that was about his victory. That's because he trusted in God for the victory. But in close association with the victory was his vow, and especially his commitment. And what it cost him to obtain that victory. So this story is really a testimony of faith. Of a commitment that cost so much. Jephthah and his daughter demonstrate that very plainly. And essentially, God is telling us, by noting this story in the scripture and putting him in chapter 11 of Hebrews, God is telling her, us, look at this man and look at what he did. This is how I want my children to be. A commitment that costs so much that we do not shrink from it. And so God gave him, God repaid him more than he could imagine or think. So what about the practical applications for us today? First thing I want to look at, first application. Here was a man who was willing to lose that which was very, very dear to him for the sake of 
others for the sake of the deliverance of his people. He was willing to sacrifice something so that his people might have the victory. In this we see actually an example of what Christ himself did. And this is what heaven saw. As heaven looked down on this situation, and here is Jephthah, and what it cost him, it was a mini picture of what Christ would do for his people. You see, Christ made a commitment and he tells us in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Christ had made a commitment and he had made a vow before the foundations of the world were laid that if something happened, he would make a, make a sacrifice. He would give up something and what he would give up was his very own life. This is why when God saw what Jephthah did, he said, take note of that. That's an example of faith for us. Jesus spells that out very plainly. John 10, 15 tells us, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Christ risked his very own existence because of the commitment he made to save us, because of his love for us. Was it hard? Was it difficult? Very Hard, very demanding, and very difficult. But he had made a commitment. Now the question, now application comes home to us as well. The question is a very simple question. How is your commitment and my commitment to the Lord? Here we're presented with an example of a man who made a commitment that cost him so much. How is your commitment? Is it costing? How is it? With you, This is really the important lesson we want to focus on today. It will cost something to be faithful to the Lord. It cost Jephthah something, and God honored that. Is it costing us something in our commitment to the Lord? Or is our commitment to the Lord a little half-hearted? That is really the question that comes out from this story. Jesus said it very well. Luke 14, 27. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What does the cross represent? Difficulties, trials, burdens, something hard, a sacrifice. Jephthah did that. And Jesus said, in order for, him, for us to be his disciples, if we're going to make a commitment, it will cost something. And the story of Jephthah is a reminder for us of that. Jesus said we need to count the cost and be willing to sacrifice all if we want to follow him. That's the commitment the Lord is looking for. And I think that's why the devil is really distorting that story so we miss the beautiful example that we have in this man. You know, I, I won't ask you the question, but if uh, any parents were in Jephthah's shoes, I don't know if you thought of that when you read the story, I wonder how we would react if we were in his shoes. I really wonder. But he went through with it. That was a commitment. In Luke 9.62, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's Lot's wife. Isn't that right? It reminds you of that. Go forward, but looking back. Jesus says, No man is fit for the kingdom. If you put your hand to the plow and you look, Back. If you make a commitment, it needs to be a serious commitment. If you make a decision to make the Lord your, uh, the Lord Jesus, the Lord and Master of your life, it needs to be a serious commitment. So my question to you today is, how is your commitment? How is it going? Is it real? Or is it half-hearted? You know, this is really the only choice we can make. Talking about things uh, relating to righteousness by faith this morning. The only choice we can really make is not to choose to be good or be better. The only choice we can make is to commit all and surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only valid choice that we can exercise with the free choice that God gave us. You realize that? The only valid choice is to surrender and to commit all to Christ. It's not to try and do better or try and, and, and follow this or, or obey this. It's to first of all give our heart to Him then He enables us. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 
chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We have commitment issues in the church. Very serious commitment issues. That's why I want us to remember the story of Jephthah. He was a man that did not have a fear of commitment. And God is looking for that. He says, listen, the just will live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Are we living by faith or are we drawing back? Are we faltering in our commitment? That's the question I want us to think about. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Here is Christ telling us what it will cost. Isn't that right? And it requires a commitment to be a disciple. The cost is everything that we have. Are we really paying the cost? How is our commitment? Is it like Jephthah? Or is it faltering? You see, Jephthah was willing to give up much in order to obtain that victory. He wasn't expecting an animal. He knew that it would cost something. How much are we willing to give up? And he was willing to give that up in order for his people to have the victory, to be delivered. How much are we willing to give up for the deliverance of others? How much are we willing to give up to live a holy life and so that others might live a holy life. If we make a commitment to the Lord, if we make a vow, we need to keep it, brothers and sisters. Now, I'll put it to you that God actually enabled Jephthah to keep his vow. And it's only God who will enable us to keep our commitment to the Lord. But we need to be willing. We need to be willing to be influenced to keep that commitment. Only the Lord can do that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, gives us a word of advice here, and I want us to apply that with regards to our commitment to the Lord. It says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay, to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it, is it that thou shouldst not vow than that thou shouldst vow and not pay. I want you to think about that for a minute. You say, well, that, that makes good sense. We see Jephthah in that story, he made a vow, he paid it, he wasn't a fool. But what about you and me? You know what this verse says, if we apply it in what way we said? God is saying, it is better for you not to commit your life to me at all, than to commit and not follow through with your commitment. Isn't that right? That's actually Laodicea's problem. Jesus preferred Laodicea to be what? To be cold, that means no commitment at all, or hot. But the problem in Laodicea is, is they made a commitment and they are not following through. That's what it talks about here, the sacrifice of fools. They say and they do not. They is really us. Isn't that right? Say and do not. That's why the story of Jephthah is for us today. So the question is, how is your vow to the Lord? We need to be honest in our commitment. You know, when you became a Christian, when you were baptized, you made a commitment. You took a vow before the Lord. How is that going? Is my question. Because Laodicea says, but doesn't do. It costs something. You know, husbands and wives, when you stood there and you said, I do. And when I stood there, when I said, I do, that's it. That's a commitment. That's a vow for good. These are important aspects. And this is why God put this man's name in the chapter of faith. You know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man shall come, shall he find faith on the earth? That's what he's looking for. And what kind of faith is Christ looking for? He puts the name of Jephthah among the list of those who are faithful as an example of the kind of faith he's looking for. A commitment that will cost much. This is really what happened in that story. This is what Jephthah did with his daughter, and this is what we need to do. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's what happened to Jephthah's daughter. She was presented as a living sacrifice for the rest of her life. It was such a deep commitment that she would never, ever marry. How is your commitment? How is my commitment? 
I want to appeal to you because, brothers and sisters, a half-hearted commitment is not faith at all. And too many of us suffer from this phobia in our spiritual experience with the Lord. Half-hearted commitment is not faith. We need to have the attitude of Jephthah. And if we don't have it, we need to seek the Lord. That's the only way we can get it. It's not something that we need to, you know, encourage ourselves with and try and muster up a bit more energy so we can be committed. If we are having struggles, if we're having trouble, the only place we can find the help we need is in the Lord Himself. And we need to have the attitude that says, I have made a commitment. I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. Isn't that right? I cannot go back. His daughter understood the importance of that vow as well, as we said. And, and children, those who are still under their parents' authority here. I want you to think of the example of the daughter. This is our last part here. What the daughter did. And the application here for us, for children, is you need to submit to your parents and obey them in the Lord. And to encourage your parents to be faithful to God. This daughter actually encouraged her father. She didn't say, this is really hard, Father, you know, we need to talk about this. So why don't we pray about it? She didn't do any of this. She said, Father, you have opened your mouth. Do to me what you said. Just give me time to weep because this is really hard. Now it'll be hard. There'll be challenges. There'll be sacrifices to make. But she encouraged the faith of her father. In submitting to what her father had vowed, she actually demonstrated a submission and a respect to the God of her father. This is really why she was commendable. Submitting to our parents is recognizing the authority of God and submitting to God himself. And that's what this girl had done. She was willing to do whatever was necessary at whatever price and cost to her to maintain her father's faithfulness to his God. And that was a very big sacrifice. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. In the Lord, this is, this is right. How many children today would obey if they were placed in a situation like that daughter? I wonder. If, if daddy comes home one day and says, daughter, you know what? You'll never be able to get married because I made a vow to the Lord. I wonder how many children today would do what that daughter did. Now, praise God, this is not a common occurrence in this day and age. But that example, that principle was noted by heaven. That's why it's recorded in the scriptures for our instruction and our admonition. God is saying, look at what a commitment means. It costs something. And God regards that very, very highly. How is your commitment? How is my commitment today? This girl gave up her future in order to keep her father's vow. How, what are we giving up? What are we sacrificing? You know, it takes sacrifice, like as that scripture tells us here. We need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. The word sacrifice there means just that. We give up something. It costs something. That's what a real commitment is all about. Giving ourselves to the Lord. So I want to make an appeal here to you. In light of that, as we close, our time is up. If you are here and you have never made a commitment to the Lord, I want to appeal to you, I want to invite you to make the commitment to the Lord. It's a commitment that will cost a lot, but you know what? The benefits and the repayments are greater than you could ever sacrifice. You know, Jephthah thought he was sacrificing a lot and he thought that was it for him and his name was gone. You know, his name is now immortalized. Everybody knows Jephthah, who reads the Bible at least. And in heaven, we'll all remember Jephthah and we'll remember his sacrifice, what he had given up. So if you have not made a commitment to the Lord, I want to invite you. If you believe Christ is the Son of the living God, he died for our sins, and you really have not made that commitment, today is the best day to do it. Do you know that? Today's the day of salvation. You say, well, I might not be ready right now. I'll think about it. You will never be more ready than you are right now. If you have not made that commitment, I want to invite you strongly to look at the example of Jephthah and to make that commitment to the Lord. You will never be more ready and God will reward you richly. And it's not the reward really that's the motivation. You will have an experience with the Lord that you cannot know about unless you actually make that commitment. 
My second appeal I want to make to you is perhaps uh, for those of us who have made the commitment, but we haven't really been true to our commitments. We have faltered along the way. We have let things slip in. And we have not been faithful to our vow and our commitment, which we made to the Lord when we became Christian, when we took on the name Christian, when we said, Lord, I will give you my all. And we sing the hymn, you know, I surrender all. We say the words, if you have had your commitment taken out and weakened by the enemy, I want to make an appeal to you to make a recommitment and come back to the Lord. He is willing to heal and forgive. You know the wonderful thing? We serve a God who loves to forgive. You know, that fascinates me actually sometimes. We talk about it so much it almost loses its meaning. But God loves and delights to forgive sinners, to restore us, to heal us, to lift us up, and show us the way to walk in it. So if you have not been faithful to your commitment, why not make a recommitment now in return? You know, we're at a camp or a place where we can pray together and fellowship together and we can return home and say, Lord, I have not been as faithful as I should be. Help me to be faithful like Jephthah was. Help me to see what it will cost and to be willing to give what it will cost. You know, time is very, very short. So I want to close with those two appeals. And God's uh, promise is is sure and true. He will give exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So if this is you, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to ask for people to stand up. This is between you and the Lord. As we kneel and pray, I invite you, if you want to respond to that appeal, to tell our Father about it. Let's kneel and pray together. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.